When you're a side man, easy job. You know, you're done, you play your stuff, you do it, you leave, you go back to the hotel. But the, the whole thing that's remembered is, you know, it was John Prine's show, it was Eric Anderson's show, it was Simon Garfunkel's show. And, oh yeah, we really liked that lead guitar player. What was his name again? Oh yeah, well maybe we'll find it in the paper, you know. We had a little house up in the country. I had a big old radio. I used to love to listen to, to stuff that I wouldn't normally hear in New York. I would listen to the steel guitars and the clean, crisp sounds of the harmonies and the bluegrass. And so I was kind of falling in love with the two at the same time. And there was a guitar lying around my house uh, from my brother's college and high school days. And it only had two strings on it. So I used to pick up my mother's uh, lipstick holder and start to play slide Hawaiian guitar with it. I went professional very young. And when you're going professional at such a young age, you know, you're learning as audiences are listening. You go up in front of an audience and it's do or die. A lot of the artists I played with uh, back in the 70s, in the singer-songwriter era, they were folk artists or folk country. They wanted me for a lot of the flash I would add to their show. A lot of the gigs I've done, I don't know if those artists were going through experimental stages or whatever, but you know, you'd have a six month gig and then that would be it. And then it'd be like another gig and then that would be it. You don't realize the level of um, intensity that you're putting out there when you're on the road. You know, I think that the performing part of it may have been the easiest part for me. I think it's the other stuff, being on the bus with four or five people for six months. I think all that stuff starts to add up. I was a kid, I would always say, you know, I'm going to pick up the guitar today and I'm going to just learn something new on it. So every time I pick up the guitar, to me, it, I start writing, I start creating. There's not much of a difference really between visual and, you know, and sound. To me, it's really pretty much the same thing. It's been reinterpreted many times. I mean, a lot of the great old um, blues players like Sun House and Muddy Waters and, of course, Robert Johnson, they all played slide guitar. Even B.B. King, you know, B.B. said when he developed his wonderful... That, that, that vibrato of his, he said that's because he couldn't play slide. But growing up in Mississippi, he always heard guys with the slide, and that's how he developed his wonderful vibrato. These were the predecessors to the electric guitar. This is called a resonator. And they wanted to, this to project and be louder than, than other guitars at the time. But they were quickly outmoded by the fact that electric guitars suddenly appeared. You know, these were beautiful. And back in the old days, they used to etch the palm trees, and the sunsets, and you know, there was, there was no question about it. It had something to do with Hawaii. <laughs> In the early 70s, around 72, I started writing books. I had to really, really learn about what I was doing, what I was teaching. What is it about guitar playing that you, you know, you can pick up an instrument and just isolate one string? How are you doing that? Most people I say, well, play this note. And they'll be like, yeah, I said, no, don't you see? You had to stop five strings to make the one ring. I used to encourage my students to, which was my favorite thing, I would encourage them to tape the lessons. I still do today. And uh, one day, a student said to me, you know, he moved away to Colorado and he was like, I really miss those lessons on tape. 
I was like, aha, uh -huh, ding, you know, a little thing went off in my head and I said, I'm gonna do that as a, as a, a business one day. And I started with like six tapes and then just started branching out. Eventually I filmed 250 lessons with me and, and lots of famous, great, great musicians. In many cases, it's the only time they've ever been documented. A lot of people are not used to bending a lot on an acoustic guitar. Like that, see? That's the stuff that makes everybody jealous of guitar players. And the guitar just has so much um, versatility. It has four or five distinctly vocal qualities. Number one is the bend, unquestionably. The vibrato, the hammer-on, and the pull-off, you know. I know there are the bluegrass fanatics that believe you should never be doing any of that. You have to pick every note. And you get these banjo effects. When I'm using my thumb, it's more for like a warm sound, like Travis picking, you know? You have to be in touch with your creative process, no matter how haphazard that may be. You have to let yourself, allow yourself that freedom. That's why I love the old cars, the freedom of design that people had back then in the 40s and 50s. I was burned once, 1944, but I ain't gonna let that happen to me no more. Cause I'm a burned child, oh yes I am. And I'm afraid of fire. With one acoustic guitar, you can make so much happen. And this is just another language. Put it in a child's hands at the right time, and they're going to speak with it. And if somebody, the right person, encourages them, it's going to be uh, something they're going to express themselves with. Mm -hmm.